All right, welcome everybody uh, to the fourth episode of the Agile Spain webinar series. Um, I have to say that I'm very surprised because you know, 100, like 170 people uh, have signed up for, for the webinar. I think it's like uh, impress. Jen is the highest number of attendees that has signed up for, for a webinar. So, so this is uh, great. I don't know if this is a vanity metric or not, but you know, it's, uh, <laughs> For sure, for sure, it's a it's a great number. Um, so going to the topic that matters. Um, so today we will be. I think that the topic that we have today is like a little bit intricate uh, at some point, uh, which is how the design basically fits into the product development um, team. Um, so hopefully we will. You know, thanks to thanks to Jen, we will be debunk some myths, uh, try to clarify some questions uh, on how we can. Put, you know, make this, you know, the world of design and the product and the product works together uh, to try to create, you know, better products. Um, so for that reason, we have today a Jennifer, Jennifer Atkins, which is the uh, head of product design at Six Health. So Jen, thank you so much for giving us your time and welcome. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, so hey, everyone. Thank you so much for having me. Uh, my journey with design began about 10 years ago. Uh, and it's incredible to see just how much our discipline has evolved along the way. Uh, I'm excited to spend this time with you and share my real world experience and techniques that I've incorporated into my design process. Uh, so a bit about my background, I started out as a visual designer in print, uh, and then I quickly learned about this cool thing called the web and how if something wasn't working the way you intended it to, you could just go back and iterate and make it better and continuously make improvements. So much so that I even tried to be the person to execute on that and uh, pr tried to be a developer for a couple of years. And then I realized that um, developers are actually wizards uh, and they are magical and I uh, am better suited on more of the strategy end uh, with design. Um, and so I, with that, I'm going to kind of take you through what I have learned on that design side, just that specialty uh, that I've really honed my skill set in over the, uh, over the year. So before we begin, I'd like to recommend a question for you to ask in your next interview with a potential employer. Uh, and now the reason that I'm recommending this question is because it could save you from potentially taking the wrong opportunity. So let me go ahead and uh, advance to that next screen. So I asked this question of my most recent employer uh, when I interviewed with them about three months ago. Now, the job that I was at, I was at Snag, a tech company, and the team I was on was amazing. Uh, and we were humming along with continuous discovery and delivery, delivering customer value and iterating and making improvements. And it was, it was a really great time for me to be in that role at Snag. Uh, but then I was approached by a startup who who has a mission of helping people take control of their health management, specifically those who are living with a chronic condition or caring for somebody with a chronic condition. And it happens to be a, a problem space that's really near and dear to my heart. So it was very compelling for me. However, I didn't want to um, end up uh, taking an opportunity without understanding and aligning um, what their definition of a designer is. So. I asked them to talk a bit about their definition of a product designer and their expectations within the role. Uh, and I was listening for you know, these cues of beautiful or pretty, intuitive, pixel perfect prototypes. And, and at that point, you know, if, if I'd heard those, then I was going to do this, put the interview coffee down or the sandwich down and carefully walk away because what we do is way beyond uh, just that part. That is just a piece of this overarching puzzle that we have that we put together and formulate. Um, and so luckily for me, in that case, the CEO uh, that I was interviewing with said to me, Jen, I'm just gonna cut straight to the chase and I'm gonna tell you, I'm not hiring you to make things pretty. As soon as he said that, I visibly exhaled and it was a moment of joy for me. And then he went on to talk about how design would actually inform the business strategy and drive a valuable customer experience. So if you were to ask me, um, what is the role of a product designer? Uh, my answer would be 
that we actually make strategy beautiful and users badass. And I'm just gonna move this over to the side. Um, and so what I mean by that uh, is, you know, for a spoiler alert, I'm big on uh, team collaboration and a perpetual optimist, which I'm sure you can tell by my bold color choice. Hopefully it's not making your eyes bleed. <laughs> um, so when I say we make strategy beautiful, I don't mean that we do this alone. Rather, we unite and inspire our team, our stakeholders, our leadership, our customers. And together, we understand our business and user needs. We fall in love with problems and we collaborate to iteratively deliver customer value and make a difference. So our role, if you read through that, is that we unite and we inspire. That's where kind of our special powers come into play. Um, and so on the following slides, I'll take you through uh, a process that I've kind of come to know through the years of what uh, has turned out to be a healthy product development life cycle, if you will. Uh, and then also along the way, I'm going to share some techniques and some artifacts along the way. Awesome. So great. Um, so before before you move on, uh, Jen, let me try to give you a couple of logistics to the people who are on the on the webinar. So yeah. um, so the idea is that Jen is going to share uh, the whole deck with us, and then after that we will try to tackle address some of the questions that you guys have submitted before the webinar. Uh, and if there is another question that pops up into your mind, just put it on the chat. Are we collecting them? And if we have time, we will try to tackle also. So uh, don't worry about it. Um, so. That's all. So, Jen, if you wanna, if you wanna continue, please. Talk. Absolutely. Yep. And then, thank you to those who did submit questions beforehand. It was actually really valuable for me to have that information, because honestly, right now you're kind of my customer, and I need to deliver a valuable experience for you. I want you to walk away feeling like, okay, this time that I spent uh, away from my personal life, my loved ones, was actually valuable. Um, so again, thank you so much for your time um, and for submitting those uh, questions to help me frame this presentation. Um, so without further ado, these are some of the techniques that I have. Uh, so number one is really you must have a deep understanding of the problem space in order to make a true impact. You have to understand the user journey and what their needs are, but above and beyond that, you also need to understand your business model and competitors in the problem space, really understanding where maybe they have gaps and where your specific product could come in and be a differentiator within that space and then as well balancing qualitative and quantitative research so you know people can get very focused on quantitative numbers that are coming back from analytics data but you need to understand the why behind those numbers so why are people not able to complete this task um, instead of throwing spaghetti at the wall and hoping it sticks dig in uh, contact customers do the research figure it out um, and so, you know, through this uh, process, it becomes pretty messy. Discovery is messy. Uh, and so you need a way to quickly uh, synthesize what you're learning and organize your thoughts. The last thing you want to do is create hundreds of pages of documentation. Uh, and so one of the, uh, the best ways that I found about uh, doing this is actually one that Jeff Patton taught us in a passionate product ownership workshop. He calls it the Delta Next Board. So this is essentially a whiteboard and you can kind of see I have one behind me. Um, that I use. And uh, this is, a, again, this is a collaborative effort. Um, these are post-it notes with problems and observations and ideas that have been accumulated through uh, going through this discovery process. And not only are you going through this process, but you're, you're teaming up with your product manager, your team, your lead dev, your engineers, your stakeholders. Uh, and together, you're coming up with, okay, what are we learning? So what were we right about? What were we wrong about? What did we learn? What do we want to continue to learn about? What are some of the ideas that we have um, to solve this, you know, solve for these problems? Uh, and so through that, what you should get out of this uh, is, you know, post-it notes with lots of different handwriting on it. It shouldn't just be yours. It should be a cumulative effort. Um, and uh, everybody has kind of that shared understanding um, of what you're learning together through this process. And this is something that you carry with you throughout your entire uh, design life cycle. So as you're learning new things about maybe features that you have launched further down the road, you're adding onto the post-its on the board. So I have literally layers and layers of post-its on top of each other right now. 
them, but it's a good way for us to kind of have it in a visual place. Now my company um, as a startup, um, we are trying to save costs on operations, so we work remotely. I also have a digital version of this, um, so I use, um, I think it was uh, called Real Time Board, and now it's uh, been recently renamed um, to, um, I can't, the name, Miro. Um, so, you know, if you guys are in a space where maybe you're not co-located with one another, you don't have rolling whiteboards or, uh, you know, that, uh, the such, you do have still opportunity to collaborate online together. There are ways to work around that. Uh, so kind of digging in a little bit more on the, the skill set, the crux of what the product designer does, you truly understand the needs of customers. You're the person that's that voice of the customer. You're that advocate of the customer. You're the one that's, you know, boots on the ground. Um, the product manager is with you. The, the engineering team's with you. The product manager is, while they are also user-minded, they're more business minded. So you kind of have that balance together between uh, the business and the customers. You want to make sure that you're maintaining that balance. Uh, Howard Schultz, uh, former CEO of Starbucks, when he, he uh, I was listening to a podcast called uh, Masters of Scale and he was one of the hosts on it. And he said that when he was in a uh, board meeting, he would have two empty chairs. And one represented the customer and the other represented the partner. That's who they call their employees. Uh, and so those empty chairs are, are there as a way for uh, the board to center around and say, okay, we're about to make this business decision. How will it impact these people? How is it going to impact them? Um, and so that's kind of the same uh, essence that you take with you. So as you're going through uh, user research, you are not just keeping these you know, documented somewhere in a filing system, you're making them visible. Uh, you're bringing people along with you. So when I do customer research interviews, I usually have my product manager with me or an engineer, sometimes both. Um, we try not to go above, you know, three, uh, three of the, you know, people being present at uh, an interview just because uh, we don't want to, uh, you know, appear, you know, um, I guess, uh, make the other user uncomfortable, the, the customer uncomfortable. Um, so I really love doing this type of interviews uh, in person, so observational research, uh, being there in their environment, because oftentimes customers, what they say and what they do are different. We like, we as humans have ideal images of ourselves. And so we tell you what we believe we are, are the ideal um, part of us, but really our actions are much different from, from what we say. So it's always so important to, uh, to make sure that you're taking in that observation. And so when you're asking you know, a question uh, you say, tell me about a time when. So get them to tell a story. Just as we're storytellers, we need to get the stories from them. And so as you go through that, you want a way to quickly document uh, what you're learning from these users, from these potential customers. Uh, they can be non-customers or customers. Uh, and one way that we found really works well is uh, Teresa Torres through Discovery Coaching had talked to us about user snapshots. And so I actually have some here um, that I've done uh, and actually a whole stack. And so I actually take these with me to meetings uh, and not just design meetings, business meetings, uh, and I have them spread out on the table. And it's a way for us to be, uh, th those are essentially the empty chairs in the room, if you will. So when we're thinking through decisions, we're able to quickly look at these snapshots. These are observations and insights, things that they're saying, um, things that they're doing, basic information. So, uh, you know, it's great to know if we're developing an app, if our target persona actually has a smartphone device and they want to download apps and they have the space on their phone to do it and you know the technology to be able to do that um, so these are all things that you want to make sure you you have um, you know ready and handy and it's also informing your personas uh, another type of research I really like doing is immersive research so product manager and I at snag actually spent um, a month with customers and we said, you know, our job was to help employers get uh, interviews scheduled and get the quality qualified candidates show up to their interviews. And it's a harder task than you may think. And for employers, you know, they spend about 20% of their time on this because they have so many other things going on. Uh, and so in order for us to really understand where those pain points are and where SNAG could help, 
solve problems for them on that end, we needed to live the life of the customer and experience it. So with customer interviews, it's great to get, you know, it's always great to be interviewing, but 15 minutes doesn't always help you get to the crux of what this problem space is. Another great way is, again, with observational research, um, something we noted during those interviews was uh, there was a group of uh, interview candidates that had a tendency to show up late or no show. And uh, when we started looking at the patterns, we realized there was a bus stop nearby um, this restaurant. And so these were people that were taking public transportation. So we needed to understand well, why are these people taking public transportation getting here, you know, later having this problem. So another researcher and I took a day uh, and we actually took a route that one of the interview candidates took. Um, she took public transportation to get to her interview for a 9 a.m. interview on a Thursday. And so we picked a Thursday, uh, we went to the bus stop that she would have gotten on, and we found that what is a 15 minute driving distance is actually an hour long bus ride for her with multiple stops. And so uh, what we realized along the way also is that 30 seconds could actually make or break your interview showing. Uh, and how we learned this the hard way was that one of the bus stops had actually moved, but there was nothing on the transportation app that we downloaded or their website that told us that. It was actually a passerby that said, what are you doing standing here? The bus stop moved down the street. So we ran to it in time to see the bus go by. And then the next bus wasn't for another 15 minutes. So hence, we didn't make our interview on time. But again, that's stuff that we would not have known had we not actually taken the time to do observational research. And from that, we're actually able to take those findings back to the team and say, how might we help these people get to interviews on time? It's not that they don't want the job. It's just they, they feel bad that they have missed their opportunity. They've missed that interview. So now they feel like they don't have a chance. So uh, once you have that, you know, you're the voice of the customer, you make those research findings accessible and visible. There are many ways that you can go about doing that. So you can, uh, we have a Slack channel, um, discovery channel on Slack, and I'll just, you know, put quotes up there from uh, interviews that we've had, uh, share these insights. Um, but another way that I love um, going about doing that is actually having workshops. Uh, and so workshops, I, I don't schedule those willy nilly, um, you know, workshops come in different flavors. So you want to be mindful because you're taking people's time and you are taking their, you're draining their cognitive load. You're causing them to think critically. Um, and so you want to make sure that these workshops will provide value for your participants, that they realize why they need to be there. And really it's all about aligning together on the desired outcome and understanding opportunities. So uh, my workshops, uh, I have a kit that I take with me. Um, and then inside of the kit are all kinds of post-it notes and Sharpies, voting dots and tape and all of this. Um, and also I have uh, a bag of candy. Um, to lure them with. Uh, sometimes it's lunch, uh, sometimes it's breakfast, uh, but I find if you're able to feed them, they're more likely to come. Uh, and then we just get in a room and you know we tape up those uh, user snapshots. You can see that I have some tape up here from a recent session that we did at Six Health. Uh, and you get them on the board and then you have people take about seven minutes to read through these snapshots and uh, they start writing down on Post-its one problem that they've observed for Post-it or one observation they've made per post-it. You want to keep them focused on the problems and the observations, not solutions at this point, because everybody's so quick to jump to solutions that you'll miss that opportunity if you're not careful. And so from that, uh, once people have actually, um, you know, come up with these problems, I ask each person one by one to go through and read off their post-its and then put them on a board. Uh, and then once everybody goes around the room and does this, then uh, I ask them to start grouping them into problem themes. So this problem sounds similar to this problem. Let's go ahead and group it together and then so on and so forth. So you start to create these problem themes, if you will. Um, and so from that, uh, you talk through that and you say, okay, so this is, this is the problem theme. For instance, this takes too much time. That's what we're hearing over and over again. It takes too much time to fill out these forms. It takes too much time to, you know, tell my doctors about uh, what's going on with me and, you know, that kind of thing. And so then we start thinking, okay, well, 
if we took this problem and we framed it as an opportunity, what would they say? And so, for example, this would be, it, you know, it saves me time and I'm organized. That would be one of them. And so this becomes an opportunity. Now we have a desired outcome and our desired outcome is the actually, because we're starting out, it's the, the vision of the company. Um, for you guys, it might be an OKR. If you have uh, multiple teams within your organization, like we did at Snag, uh, you can align around an OKR and say, this is our desired outcome. Here are the opportunities we have. While you can't exactly solve for these opportunities, all of them at the same time in one quarter. Uh, so what you wanna do is prioritize. That way um, you're able to really quickly focus in on an opportunity, think through all the solutions and then start experimenting with them. So you don't wanna get bogged down with so many opportunities that you can't make an impact within a short time. The best way to do it is to vote on these opportunities. So once your team has taken some time and they voted on the opportunity they believe is going to provide the most impact for reaching that desired outcome, then it's time to think through all of the solutions. And this is kind of everybody's favorite space, especially stakeholders um, and CEOs. They really love this uh, solutioning phase. <laughs> so everybody uh, comes up with the solutions for this opportunity. You put them on the board. Um, I always say no solution is a bad solution right now. It's just about getting your ideas out there. And then once you have them on the board, then you do a dot voting exercise. So that solutioning exercise is a silent exercise. Um, and they all take time and they write down a solution for post-it note, get it on the board, and then everybody starts voting on which solutions they believe are gonna provide the most value. So you want, when you walk away from this workshop, at least three solutions to experiment with uh, moving forward. Uh, and then once you have that, then it's time to validate your solutions. So when you have solutions, you automatically have some assumptions associated with that solution. And these are your risky assumptions. You believe that this solution is going to work. Well, before you go and spend time to put it in, you know, to development and spend a quarter to get it out there, you want to find out in the fastest way possible if this solution is going to deliver customer value or not. So for example, uh, at Snag, we had an interview scheduling feature. And uh, within that feature, we were trying to figure out how we could make it more efficient for employers. Uh, and so one of the solutions that we came up with was, oh, wouldn't it be great if they could actually connect their work calendar or their personal calendar to the Snag interview calendar? Because then everything will just populate over. They'll know, you know how to plan for the day. They don't have to necessarily log into Snag. It's another step that we can eliminate for them at that point. So we feel pretty good about this solution. We're like, of course, they're going to want to connect to their calendar. So I created a fake door test where after an employer scheduled an interview, we had a modal pop up and we said, awesome, would you like to add this to your calendar, connect this to your calendar? And then we gave them several options. So uh, the popular ones, iCal, uh, Google, Outlook, et cetera. Uh, so we allowed them to select it and we would record the one that they selected. And then we would also have two buttons. We have the explicit connect, meaning I'm interested, I want to connect my calendar. So it's as if it already exists. Um, and then also a, uh, I'm not interested or no thank you. Uh, and so we were able to record uh, which you know, buttons had the most interaction. Uh, and what we found was that employers didn't care. They, they had no interest in connecting their calendars. Um, so wasn't it great that we saved a lot of dev time and resources and a quarter's worth of work to validate that this actually wasn't gonna pro pro you know, provide customer value. And so the great thing about that is that we already had another bank of solutions that we had thought about. Now it was time to peel off the other solutions and experiment with them and validate them. And eventually you will find something that is worth building, I promise you. And it won't take that long to get to. Um, so, you know, that was a fake door test. You can, uh, and also kind of like a, a Wizard of Oz where we've actually uh, been the person doing the scheduling in the background. So the employer thinks that they're scheduling interview, but we're actually in the background scheduling it for them. Uh, and then also as a startup, if you are part of a startup, 
uh, we don't have a product out there right now. It's uh, we're in that that phase of building the product, and so we didn't have uh, anything on our site to you know enable a pop up and and ask people to say yes or no. So what we did was we created AdWords, um, Google AdWords. So they're text AdWords. They were campaigns, and we had Val props associated. So we had three different solutions we were thinking through, uh, and we created text uh, AdWords and put it out there on Google, and then put traffic towards it to see okay um, you know these are the different campaign groups uh, and then we're going to go ahead and see which ones uh, have the most signups as a result so our goal was to get people to sign up for uh, our uh, email which is actually a pretty large ask um, but that way we were able to measure which of these solutions were uh, potentially providing the most customer impact and that was the solution that we were going to go ahead and start with um, to build and then design like you're right and test like you're wrong. So again, that fake door test, I designed it as if this thing exists and then we tested it and then we quickly learned um, nobody has interest in, in connecting their calendar at this point. Doesn't mean forever and ever, but it just means table that for now and find something that is uh, providing customer value. So once you have uh, a solution, uh, it is you see the promise of it, um, that it is in fact going to create customer value. This is the process that, you know, if you uh, were to rewind back to the beginning of, of our conversation, uh, where, you know, employers uh, typically see the designer position being placed. You create the user flows, you design out the wireframes, you put them into usability testing, you card them up and you get it out the door and, and, and do QA and, and, and the like. So, but at this point, these are validated prototypes that you are putting into development um, and, uh, you know, at this point, the engineers have been with you the entire way. They uh, know what's going on. It's not a throw it over the fence type of thing. Um, and, you know, it just makes that development process actually go a lot quicker. Uh, so you're collaborating with the content strategist on the content experience. I felt like that was important to call out as well. Uh, so whenever I'm working through a design flow, I'm also working with the content strategist. I have placeholder copy that's not awesome, but I know somebody that can create that narrative arc and make sure that that design flow and that copy is really creating an optimal user experience. Um, and so we actually have a thing called a content matrix and it's an Excel spreadsheet. Uh, and within that spreadsheet, I have it kind of set up like a Jira board or Trello board where I have to do in progress done and it's copy specific. So um, I decompose my uh, prototypes, copy over my placeholder copy and say, you know, this is a dialogue in this dialogue. It's this headline. It's this body copy. It's this, uh, text button. Um, if it's an alert, if it's a landing page, if it's an email, making sure that I have subject line, header, body, and button. And just it enables the uh, content strategist to be able to put that copy in there. And then as well, uh, it actually brings my developers joy. When I take them through this, they're excited because they can just copy and paste the copy over um, from, from this matrix into uh, into development and then as well if you're translating this into multiple languages then this is just an easier way to do that um, so again you're running usability testing you're finalizing your prototypes uh, you're breaking up into user stories you're aligning with the devs on acceptance criteria make sure that you are solid with API um, you know getting those requirements um, sometimes that can kind of catch you off guard uh, so you want to make sure uh, you know from an API perspective and a front-end perspective everybody has an understanding of how this you know all comes together once you have it out there it's not put it to the side and move on to the next big thing. You're kind of focusing maybe about 30% of your time uh, measuring impact and informing next steps uh, as you are spending maybe 70% of your time on another opportunity. Uh, 
Um, but you want to make sure that you're partnering up with your product manager. Now, the product manager, uh, at least the ones that I've worked with, they love their analytics and they usually have their browser tab open and are refreshing it 10 seconds, you know, every 10 seconds after we launch a feature <laughs> just to see how it's, um, how it's working out. Uh, and so you want to make sure that you are informed as to how things are performing uh, and making sure that you, uh, you know, you're deciding on next steps for iterations um, on this you know feature uh, one of my favorite um, stories about this and my product manager would probably kill me if I said this but uh, at snag uh, we released a feature uh, after we had followed this process the actual first time that we'd followed this process all the way through and believed in it uh, and so we had this you know uh, feature that we launched and we were sitting there and then all of a sudden I mean the user rate adoption was insane it was the largest user rate adoption that we had had in such a short period of time and without product marketing associated with it. So my product manager proceeded to go into a room and just start sobbing tears of joy because it just felt like, oh my gosh, we're validated. Like, this is so cool. This is actually bringing you know, value to customers. So it's a really cool moment to have that. Um, and then again, as you're learning, you're putting, uh, you know, your learnings onto that Delta Next board. You're crossing out solutions that may not have worked. Um, you may have come across new opportunities. So, you know, when you uh, solve a problem, you create a new one inadvertently. Um, and so you kind of want to keep your eye on that. Uh, and then just continuously check in with your users who are actually using the, the feature as well. And then you'll find that you're just going into this cadence of continuous discovery and delivery. It just becomes one and in flowing into the other and back and forth. And as you're learning something about, you know, what you have out in production, you're doing research on that. You're experimenting with ways to improve it. You're executing on it. It just becomes a cycle. And then you, I almost envision like juggling. So if opportunities were uh, a ball that you're juggling, you bring in more of these opportunities as you're able to juggle them together. Uh, and, and it just becomes this whole fluid, um, uh, continuous process. And a little piece of like geek out joy that this brought me is I inadvertently, if you look carefully at the arrows, you can kind of see the outline of a sideways U and then an X in the middle. That was not intentional, but when I saw it, I was like, my goodness, that's awesome. It's UX. Um, so sorry, had to put that out there. Um, uh, these are my influencers. So uh, Jeff Patton, Teresa Torres, Marty Kagan, Don Norman, these are all people I'm sure you guys have heard about, but these are really the people that have kind of uh, influenced me along the way. The books that I've read, um, Steve uh, Krug with Don't Make Me Think, um, Jake Knapp with, he does the design sprint, which I find valuable, but even better was I attended a Mind the Product conference in London in 2017, and his talk was phenomenal, especially around uh, his concept of watching the elbow. So understanding why, um, you know, th that problem space, why people are doing the things that they're doing. Um, so I would definitely encourage you, I have the link to, I think it's a Mind the Product um, website, uh, and that has his talk in there. Uh, Kathy Sierra, she, if you haven't read her book, um, Badass Making Users Awesome, it's just, it puts fuel in your, in your fire for passion for really trying, you know, making these customers badass. The last thing you want to do is make them feel like they're doing something wrong. Um, and then the groups and media, uh, podcasts that I listen to, uh, articles that I read, groups that I follow, um, groups that I'm part of, the Richmond Design Group is a local UX group that we have. And then, of course, my, uh, my teammates, uh, you know, who have kind of helped uh, support me and, and grow me along the way. And same thing with my directors and my leadership teams. Um, you know, without leadership buy-in, it's really hard to make this possible. So that is so important if you are in a leadership role that um, you are really giving people the time uh, they need uh, to take in order to do this process because you will find uh, customer value. You will get the results that you are looking for. And then you're also getting uh, subject matter experts. We turn into subject matter experts that you can then lean on and ask questions about um, when it comes to business decisions. It can help inform your business strategy. So that is uh, my presentation. And with that, um, we can go ahead and turn it over to questions.
Awesome. Thank you so much, Jen. I think it was pretty, pretty insightful. Uh, it seems the designer has to do a lot of, a lot of work, you know, not only, not only prototyping and this kind of thing that, you know, normally people do, uh, that designers are, you know, are meant for. Um, so if you're up for some questions, um, if you, if you want to, if you want, I can read some of them aloud. Um, I just going to cherry pick some of, some of them, um, <laughs> from the different, from the different, uh, topics that we have. Um, I I love this one. I'm sorry, this is, my, this is a bias that I have, but um, and it's basically related to what you said. Um, normally, all the problems that are related to to design are complex, so you can always see the consequence of your designs moves ahead of time. So, how do you handle that situation, especially um, when you have, for example, sometimes it's stakeholders or business people who are desperate to try to get results. I mean, they are always saying, you know, show me something, show me something that works, right? They're expecting yeah. to moving the needles, you know, very quickly. Yeah, it's about that output, right? Um, yeah, yeah. Uh, and I, I have been part of that um, where, you know, you have that pressure where you, they want you to just provide output for, you know, to keep the engineers busy. That is the absolute wrong way to go about doing it. Um, and so what I've found is that if you do this process, uh, there's a natural balance that occurs, especially if you're bringing them into these workshops, um, the, the stakeholders and leadership, you're, you're bringing them into your process and you're pulling them aside and you're showing them you know, what's going on. A natural balance occurs. They see that need uh, for taking some time to do discovery, especially if, they, if you put something out there and it's been successful following this, this process, they're more apt to become believers it. Um, and so, you know, the, the pressure will always be there. That's their job. You know, uh, they're really great at what they do and that's needed. Um, but it's always good as a designer to push back and say, you know, uh, you don't want to waste time and resources. You want to make sure that you're validating these prototypes before you put them into development. You'll save cost in the end um, and you'll save team morale in the end. Um, so, you know, just it, it, when you get into this natural balance, it's less because there's more alignment um, in creating shared understanding between your team and stakeholders. They'll see that value of discovery as it relates to building the right features. Right. So try, try to include them as, you know, as much as possible. So don't, don't exclude them. Just bring, bring them over into the, into the action so they can see, for example, what is going on and yep. all, the, all the insights that you're gathering from from discovery, from user research, and these kind of activities. Yeah, and you know they're incredibly intelligent people too. Use that, use that to your advantage. Um, you right. know, my you know at Six Health has twenty uh, years in healthcare, so he is uh, you know a great resource uh, for understanding the problem space, and he has some ideas too. Um, so don't right. lock them out of that. Bring them into this world. Yeah. Right. Awesome. Um, so I'm gonna go with some of the related to the product team topic. Um, uh, this is someone that normally happens, um, at least in my experience, it, it's occurred a couple of times. So when you have, for example, to you know run these kind of processes when you have to pull all the people together and start co-creating, uh, you know the first thing that you you get from you know for the less creative person is that you know I'm not creative. So is there is there any approach that you you have tried uh, to try to remove this kind of bias from people? Absolutely, because you get it every time, right? Um, yep. There's at least one person, and then that one person's kind of like a virus that spreads, and it's like, oh, I don't know how to be creative. Yep. Everybody's creative. They just have different ways of expressing it. Mm -hmm. So I don't like to box people into drawing shapes um, and, and pictures, because that's, that's what I do. That's my natural way of getting my creativity out there. But there are other ways that they can do it. Um, and so, uh, for example, I have engineers that'll focus on what backend architecture could look like. It's not that they're going to build it, but they're giving a vision of what could be in the back end. That's how they think. How am I going to bring this to life? Um, I have this idea. How will I bring it to life? Um, others, uh, I have uh, one engineer that uses a plain text editor and he'll just send me, um, you know, uh, words. And it's in my mind, this is how I see this happening. And then this, and then this, that's just how he thinks. 
Um, and then, uh, you know, the, for leadership, uh, they default to the, to the whiteboard and they inevitably end up drawing the business model, which is awesome because it just further aligns people on what the intent is, what the vision is, what's in their head. Um, so let them get their creativity out, uh, as, as they feel comfortable in doing it. And you'll just, you'll see, it's amazing what comes out of their minds when they're not feeling restricted to sketching because they're feeling uncomfortable in that moment. You want them to feel confident in that moment. Right. Yeah. You want to get the best out of them. Yeah. Um, so we have, oh, a yeah, go Sorry. Up. Sorry. One more thing about that. Um, so, uh, I have this thing uh, that I really love and it's riffing off of each other. Um, so yes, and, uh, is what we do. Uh, and, uh, to go along with this co-create, um, the other day I ran a workshop, uh, and I had um, people, again, it was kind of like this design, um, and I asked them, you know, I, I presented a problem through observational research that um, I had just done, it was debriefing them on, uh, and I asked them to sketch out or, you know, however they wanted to, to design out what their solutions for some of the problems they heard could be, just to kind of, you know, get their passion going and everything. And so I had one person present on their concept, and Rather than saying, oh, that sounds really cool. Um, okay, next, John, you go next. Instead, I said, all right, so everybody in the room, what I want you to do right now is I want you to riff off of what they just said. Yes, and. And what you'll see is that there are people who have kind of thought along the similar lines of them as far as, oh, this is the problem theme that I've heard. Here's a solution. It may be a little bit of a different direction. But that's where you start to get that collaboration going. It's like, yes, and I was thinking about this. And then another person in the room goes, oh, yes, and I was thinking about this. And it's just really cool how it just happens. Um, yeah. So I thought that I would bring that, mention that. I thought that it worked really well and gets people really excited. Yeah. So you just basically change the vocabulary, right? So changing, for example, how you formulate the phrase is basically completely another different view of what's going on. Yep. And then my rule is no Debbie Downers. Um, you know, no ideas are bad ideas when yeah. you're in a workshop. <laughs> yeah. All right. Awesome. So we have a question um, on the chat box from Roberto. Uh, he said, uh, what we would do if our product lost their alignment with the OKR of the department or the company because of customer adaptation. Mm -hmm. So in this instance, it's uh, there's an there's an OKR, but what you're learning perhaps in discovery isn't matching up with the uh, with the OKR. Is that what I'm? I think so. I think okay. so. Yeah. I um, so that's great. You learned something. Uh, you know, it, and we've had that happen uh, at Snag where we had a desired outcome uh, and it was based off of an OKR that we had. But through discovery, we quickly realized that that, was, that wasn't that was the elbow that we should be watching, um, yeah. that it was a different OKR. And so within my organization with Snag, they were actually pretty flexible. And because they considered us subject matter experts at that point, um, they uh, were you know okay to go ahead and change direction. Um, and then, you know, as you're doing discovery and you're sharing it with them, you start to get into a process where it will match up. Your OKR will match up because you're informing that next quarter OKR or however your cadence is through the discovery work that you're doing. You're essentially prepping for, for the OKR. Right. Right. Perfect. Um, uh, let's go with someone, someone which is, you know, normally a typical question, but it's always, you know, uh, funny to know. Uh, what was your most remarkable mistake? You know, uh, mm, thank you. <laughs> of course, um, what did you course. learn about it? Not perfect, right? Um, so I would think uh, it, it was in hindsight, thinking back in my previous days um, before I even understood the, the true role of product designer. Uh, and it was um, being okay with getting uh, requirements and solutions handed down to me. Um, you know, it, uh, for example, there was one uh, feature that our CEO, you know, we were grouped, um, we were reorged and put into a group and told, okay, for this quarter, I want you to build this feature. And so, okay, cool. Started, you know, wireframing and prototyping and, uh, you know, taking it to the devs. And the devs were the ones that pushed back on me. And they said, why are we doing this? And I said, well, because the CEO said so, and you know, we got to do yeah, this. The, like, the, the hype won't say so. Yeah, it's not the right answer, right? Um, and so, you know, 
at that moment, I was like, okay, well, let me think through how to solve this problem. My devs are not obviously not happy um, that we're building a feature uh, that a CEO wants us to build out. So how do I reverse engineer this solution into a problem? That was a terrible approach, really, because um, then I'm just making up excuses at that point. Yeah. Uh, and what I really should have done was I should have pushed back. I should have partnered up with a product manager and said, how do you feel about this? Um, you know, let's talk about what our approach could be for pushing back. Can we have, you know, the time to do a little bit of discovery? Discovery doesn't have to take six months. You don't want it to take six months. You'll never get anything out there. Um, yeah. It's continuous. It's iterative. So what can you quickly learn um, in order, you know, we should have said, okay, that's a solution you want. Let's experiment with it instead of going straight to wireframing, prototyping, and building it. Right, right. Um, I have one. Uh, you know, you said that basically the designer has to, you know, has to work also along with, for example, the product managers, the um, engineers. But do you have, uh, for example, any advice or any caveat, for example, if you are scaling uh, your product and you are creating, for example, multiple product teams, um, you know, the situation that, you know, normally we are facing here is that we don't have one, one designer, for example, for every team. So what we are doing is like creating a pool of, uh, of designers and then we are trying to pull the designers in depending on the situation. So we, we have to do something, of course, that I'm not talking the normal scenario where we are, you are doing discovery and, and delivery. You are just basically doing delivery and you have a pool of designers over there. Um, so do you have any, any caveat for, for that situation or would you recommend, for example, to put a designer on every, every product team? So we actually had something similar where we were scaling. Uh, we had more, uh, product teams than we had designers. And so we had to kind of farm ourselves out, um, if you will. Uh, and so, uh, our VP of design at the time grouped us into, uh, he called them design pods. Um, and so these design pods, uh, they were, you know, maybe we had, um, we'll go with, uh, you know, 12 designers on a team. And so we were grouped into groups of four. Uh, and then so from those design pods, uh, those groups were centered based off of um, the user journey and the persona. Mm -hmm. So if you were a designer uh, who was going to work on two product teams um, focused on employer, for example, and then you have other product teams that are focused on and other designers, they have a like product um, or um, sorry, a problem space. And so it makes sense to group them together and then group them near that product team. Right. So we tried that for a while. Um, and so the designers were co-located together, which was great because uh, we were able to co-create together. Uh, you know, I would just look over and see what the designer is up to, you know, on one part of the product and making sure that my patterns that I was coming up was, uh, you know, a similar experience. Um, and then same thing with what we were learning in research, we were able to talk to each other about it. Uh, so it was great in, in that aspect, um, where I felt like it uh, had potential to fall a little bit short is at that same time, the product team that's kind of sitting over to the side, they are developing this community together. Um, they have inside jokes because they sit next to each other and um, you know, they're, they're great people, but me being, I felt like a bit of an outsider and I wanted to be more inside of that product team because we're working so closely together to deliver you know, customer value on a feature together. So um, you know, I think that if you could do both, that would be great. We did the pods for a little while. Once we felt like we had it down, then we were able to transition into um, sitting with our product team or I would go back and forth. You know, I was out in discovery with product manager. But when I came back to the office, I would, you know, sit in my um, chair next to the design team. Right. So um, that does, you know, communication tends to um, break down as you scale up. Uh, and then that means less uh, shared understanding between teams. Uh, and then, you know, there'll be user experience gaps in the transition uh, between the states of the user journey. Uh, and then design systems become a challenge because new patterns are created, because again, lack of communication, just because it's just big at this point. And then you're at risk of duplicated efforts within teams. Um, and so that creates inefficiencies. So those are things, those are flags that you need to be mindful of. Uh, and then also how business uh, metrics for one team could potentially conflict with another teams. Right. So 
those are things that you have to be mindful of. Uh, if you're in a position of leadership or you're able to influence leadership, like these are the problems, make sure that you understand the problems before we say, this is how we're going to execute on, you know, um, on organization. So, so basically the, the, the pod that you created from, from, you know, and from designers was basically assigned to one specific problem space at that, yep. you know, design pod was, you know, responsible to work with the engineers team or where it was on, you know, allocated to that problem. And then yeah. you, when you have done that, you can move to another to another team, for example, or yeah, and you can embed yourself within that product team. I always if um, my recommendation is that you you are with your product team. So mm -hmm. if you can be co-located, which for us, you know, we're remote, um, so that's not possible right now. But um, right. co-location, you just you build this uh, this team, this community together. Uh, you experience failures together and, and you celebrate your wins together, you know, th that type of thing. So, um, you know, you want to make sure that you feel like you are part of that product team. You're not just somebody that's executing or, or being an informant. Um, you want to be right. part of it. Uh, and then, um, you know, something else to keep in mind is, again, centering on a, a similar problem space. So we did try it for a while where, uh, you know, I was going to do acquisition and then I was going to do um, some uh, an in-product journey flow. Those are two totally different contexts. Um, and so for me, having to s continually switch context between the two, I lost learning. I wasn't able to actually have a deep understanding of the problem space. They're very complex in of themselves. Um, mm -hmm. And so you have to work on multiple product teams. You, it has to be a similar um, product space, uh, problem space that you are in. Right. right, because otherwise, in that case, you know, problem switching can be very, very, very cost at that at some point, right? Absolutely. I, I kind of think of it as um, as an orchestra. You know how you have uh, main yeah. sections, four main sections: your strings, woodwinds, brass percussion. Uh, and then if you think of them as different problem spaces, uh, you have instrumentalists who have spent thousands of hours learning about their instruments and experimenting with how they work, how to care for their instruments, how it sounds when they're playing with other instruments. Mm -hmm. They know their instruments inside and out, um, and they're subject matter experts for those. Um, but if you tell them that you have to understand, you know, two sections and you have to do this while you're playing a symphony, got to put my, you know, strings down and go over to my drum now, that is a very jarring experience. And not only is it jarring for you, it's jarring for your audience or your customer because they're right. seeing that happen. Awesome. Awesome. Um, all right. So we're, we're about, you know, close to the, close to the, uh, finishing the webinar, but I just want to ask you one more question, Jen, because I, I, I was seeing there is, um, if you have to, for example, hire a, a designer, where are the, the skills that you're looking for? Or where are the questions, for example, that you, you would ask to that person who wants to be, or wants to join your team as a designer? So if we're hiring a product designer, uh, things that I'm looking for are uh, communication skills because if you're hiring a product designer, you're probably scaling up your organization and you want to make sure that they are really good about communication. Um, also, they're that customer voice, so you want to make sure that they feel comfortable communicating back to the organization and even communicating with um, customers that they have drive, um, you know, that they are passionate about trying something out, experimenting, they're okay with failing um, because you're learning something along the way. Uh, to steal a quote from one of my uh, employer, uh, my customers at Snag, um, he said to me, you know, you can teach someone to have the skills, but you can't teach them to have the personality. So, you know, making sure that they have that personality um, that collaboration, uh, you know, design is a skill. Of course, you want them to be skilled at design because uh, it does make a difference. We are designers um, and we know that design really uh, makes or breaks an experience, but it's just, it's more than that. It's so far and above beyond that. Um, but, you know, these are, these are things that I, I look at and um, questions that I ask. I really want them to be passionate about the problem space uh, because, you know, that's where you're going to get the most quality out of them as well. Awesome. Awesome. All right. So I think that we're, we last five minutes. I just want to say thank you so much, Jen, for, for being with us, for giving us your time. I know that this may be, you know, like working hours, but you're, you know, you have taken the time for, for share your knowledge uh, with the, with the community. I really appreciate it. And 
I think also um, on behalf of the of the guys from the webinar, uh, I think that they also appreciate it too. Um, please, for the guys in the webinar, just uh, give us your feedback. I'm putting a link every like two minutes. Uh, I hope it's not like you know sounds like uh, I'm chasing you guys, but uh, that would mean so much for 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 us and also for Jen that we're going to share that feedback with her as well. Um, so last heads up, uh, in the next uh, episode, uh, we already confirmed that Jeff Gottlieb will be with us. Uh, he will be talking about outcome over outputs. So a pretty interesting topic that is also related with design our the previous also webinars. So please join us uh, June 27th. Uh, Jen, again, thank you so much. Um, appreciate it. Um, we'll keep in touch. Absolutely. Thank you so much for having me. And yeah, don't hesitate to reach out with any questions. Yeah, sure. Thank you so much, guys. Bye. See you next time. Bye.